You remember those heartbreaking scenes from the Titanic, either from books or movies, right? You know, the ones where the boat was sinking, and there's nothing anyone could have done about it. Well, it turns out that that story isn't entirely true. At least, according to a historian and author of a book detailing events from that unlucky ship. If what he claims is true, every soul on the Titanic could have been saved. He wrote that the SS Californian and the SS Mount Temple were close enough to technically see the Titanic go down into the ocean, but they failed to act because they were afraid, or because they too had no idea what they were doing. Nobody thought the Titanic could ever sink back then, and it had everything you could imagine, from luxury lounges to a Turkish bath and even a squash court. But as it was racing through the ocean, ready to break the Atlantic crossing record, it hit an iceberg, and everything went downhill from there. A lot of ships wanted to help the sinking vessel and shifted their direction toward the Titanic after hearing the distress calls, but the two closest ships held back. The SS Mount Temple, for starters, was really close. It was a mere 50 miles away and could have reached the Titanic in just a couple of hours, potentially saving every passenger. However, its captain believed such a journey would be too risky. I mean, it did involve icebergs, right? There's nothing we can do about it these days, but we can use our imagination and at least save the day theoretically. Your average Joe might have had a difficult time helping people out on the Titanic, but what if we could ask for the help of superheroes? Well, for starters, it would be useful to have someone with time-traveling skills, right? They could go back in time and alert the crew that an iceberg is pretty close, and they should move the ship away from its path as soon as possible. Or, even better, go even further back in time and alert the captain of the ship not to proceed with the journey to begin with. Let me tell you, there were a lot of things that could have been done better with the Titanic. First of all, the crew had no access to binoculars. If they could have had this crucial piece of equipment, they might have spotted the iceberg in due course, at least limiting the damage or avoiding the collision altogether. And don't get me started on the lifeboats. Because they wanted the ship to look as luxurious as possible, there was little space left for those much-needed lifeboats that could have saved so many lives. Although there were 2,200 people on board, the lifeboats could only save 1,200 people. What about flight? Would a flying superhero have been able to help avoid this tragedy? I bet it would have. This superhero could have surveyed the area, especially during the night when there's low visibility to begin with. More so, the hero might have helped with alerting nearby ships faster that something went wrong with the Titanic and that help yeah. is needed to make sure no one gets hurt. If someone on board might have been able to fly, maybe they could have airlifted a bunch of passengers to safety too. Laser vision? Now that would have been cool. A person with laser vision would have pulverized that iceberg in no time. Instead of shivering in the dark that fateful night in April 1912, people would have enjoyed a nice chilled drink on the deck the next morning, courtesy of some harmless leftover ice still hanging around on the ship. Okay, okay, maybe this person with laser vision wouldn't have been powerful enough to split the iceberg in half so that the Titanic could pass safely. Well, they could have at least helped open the locked room containing the binoculars, that's for sure. Someone with superhuman strength? Yeah, that might have surely helped too. They could have placed themselves between the ship and the iceberg, preventing the collision from happening. If, say, they just happened to be snoozing when the Titanic hit the huge block of ice, no biggie. They would have simply kept the Titanic afloat until nearby ships came around to rescue all the people on board. If you'd have had underwater breathing abilities, you'd have at least been able to save yourself on the Titanic. I mean, technically, there's nothing much you could have done differently on the boat. Maybe you could have saved a bunch of other passengers, but only if you were strong enough to keep them afloat while you comfortably swam completely underwater. If a person on board had been able to control the elements, that would have been amazing. 
Not only would it have saved a lot, if not all, of the passengers, it would have been fascinating to watch. Such a superhero would have been able to keep water away from the Titanic's injuries after it hit the iceberg. If they were agile enough and had seen the iceberg before it hit the ship, they could have transformed the big block of ice into water with just the snap of a finger. If we look at the records from that night, everything happened very fast with the Titanic. Wouldn't it have been nice to have someone on board who could slow down time? For the sake of the story, let's also imagine this person had a finely tuned intuition. They could have sensed something was wrong by the way the air smelled, or by the reaction of the crew when the iceberg was first spotted. With a simple gesture of their hands, they would have slowed down time, almost to the point of stillness. They could have checked the records from the ship, its unusually fast speed, and could have alerted the captain to decide in time. The Titanic could have been stopped, or it could have been diverted away from the iceberg. A superhero with night vision would have been useful too. At least the superhero would have spotted the iceberg sooner than everyone else. Given that the hero could have seen a lot better in low light conditions, that hero would have probably better managed the rescue efforts that disastrous night. Invisibility? Would this superpower have saved the Titanic from sinking to the bottom of the Atlantic? I could think of a possible scenario or two. Anyone with the power to become invisible whenever they want to would have probably gone snooping around the ship. I mean, you have to remember, the Titanic had some of the most important members of society on board. It wasn't just any regular boat. It was probably buzzing with the latest gossip. In between all that mundane information, this superhero could have overheard the captain saying they were going faster than they should have or that there weren't enough lifeboats to save everyone in case there was a major problem. Who knows what this curious superhero might have done with all this information. Some sort of sorcerer would have saved the Titanic if they were on board, I'm sure. There has to be some sort of magic spell in a book out there that's useful for sinking ships, right? Maybe one that could have helped weld the metal back together after it got hit by the iceberg. Or maybe one that could have airlifted the entire vessel to safety after it got hit. How about a spell that would have transformed the Titanic into a submarine, creating a protective layer around it so it could comfortably move under the sea? That surely would have been cool and would have offered passengers a truly unique experience. The ability to speak to animals or fish would have certainly been useful too. Even if all else failed, so the Titanic would have still struck the iceberg and it would have still been filled with water and ended up near the seabed, people could have still been saved. That's because you'd have had someone on board who could have instructed dolphins to carry people to safety. I'm sure those intelligent creatures would have been happy to help. Once a famous giant, the largest ship of that time, now two grand pieces lying on the ocean bottom about 2,000 feet apart, torn by the catastrophic collision of time itself. The stern of the Titanic got completely ruined after hitting the ocean floor, but you can still recognize the bow since many interiors were left preserved. There's a type of bacteria found on the ship's rusticles. A rusticle is this brownish formation of rust. It occurs deep underwater when the wrought iron the ship is made of oxidizes. It means the bacteria eat the iron of the Titanic's hull piece by piece. And it seems they might finish their snack by 2030, way sooner than when anyone would expect the wreck to be gone forever. You may think it would probably be easier to take the wreck out of the water so that we got to keep it, but it would fall apart if anyone tried to do that. It's been in the water for more than 110 years now and is now so rusty that no one would be able to reconstruct some parts even if we managed to get the ship out of the ocean depths. What do you think? Could any of about 700 people that had survived the sinking of the Titanic hear it hit the ocean bottom? The largest ship that had ever been made till then disappeared literally before their eyes after all. But sound most likely wouldn't have traveled from water to air. We can't hear that well in water because our bodies are not designed to hear in such environments. And although passengers were close to the sinking site, the Titanic still hit the bottom a long distance away, 
12,500 feet. There are so many underwater landslides and earthquakes we cannot hear, and they make way more noise than a single ship slamming into the ocean floor. Most vibrations and sounds must have dispersed over a large area. Also, the down blast of water, which many believe hit the Titanic after it had touched the bottom of the ocean, would have pushed back the majority of the potential acoustic vibrations. Plus, the bottom of the ocean is not hard enough to produce such loud noises. Many survivors said they had heard terrifying noises as the Titanic was breaking apart, but none mentioned hearing anything after the ship disappeared below the surface of the water. Some survivors shared how chaotic it was when passengers, mainly women and children, were getting into lifeboats. There weren't enough boats, and still, some of them weren't even filled to their full capacity. No one knew how to react properly in such a situation. The lifeboat drill had been scheduled for the morning before the Titanic hit the iceberg, but for some reason, it got canceled. A giant ocean liner everyone believes is unsinkable takes a trip across the ocean. On its way, it strikes an iceberg and sinks. Yeah, we all know how the story goes. But what's scary is that it's also the plot of The Wreck of the Titan, a novel published in 1898, 14 years before the Titanic went to the ocean bottom or was even constructed. In the novel, the Titan, what a scarily accurate name too, didn't have enough life jackets, vests, and lifeboats for all the passengers on board. It was also the largest ship of that time, almost identical in size to the Titanic, and both the Titan and Titanic sank in April. Dorothy Gibson was an American silent film actress. She was also one of the Titanic passengers. She survived the catastrophe. Right after she came to New York, she started filming Saved from the Titanic. The film was released only one month after the ship sank. Dorothy was even wearing the same shoes and clothes she had worn when she had actually been on the ship. The movie was successful, but it got destroyed in a fire, so it only exists in memories, like Jack Dawson. Titanic wasn't all alone in the restless waves of the cold ocean near the iceberg it struck. The SS Californian was relatively close. Their radio was shut off for that night, though. At one moment, the crew members noticed mysterious lights in the sky. They immediately went to wake their captain up to tell him, but he issued no orders. Some believed it was just fireworks. They never realized it was actually a call for help. The flares, crew members of the Titanic sent off to the sky, hoping someone would notice. By the time the SS Californian got the SOS message, it was already too late. Some say a full moon may have been the reason the iceberg crossed paths with the gigantic ship. A full moon may have caused incredibly strong tides that eventually sent multiple icebergs southward, right when the Titanic was crossing that area. Would you dare to taste cheese from the Titanic? The wreck has been under the ocean surface for more than 100 years now. It took more than 70 years to find it. By that time, most of the food that had gone down together with the ship had, of course, spoiled. But it's possible there's still some of it left. Some foods are protected from decay. For example, cheese. The microbes that turn milk into cheese create special conditions to protect the product from spoiling. Multiple things have survived the Titanic. A handwritten letter where a mother and a daughter wrote to the girl's grandma about the amazing journey they were on together. The letter has been around for more than 100 years and got sold at an auction. A battered pair of white cotton gloves was found in the wreck. Musicians on the Titanic played till the very last moment. Sheet music and one violin were found among the wreckage. The bell one of the crew members rang three times to warn there was a very close iceberg on their way. A pocket watch that stopped at 1.45 a.m., the time when the ship went under the water. Perhaps one person could have changed what happened on the Titanic. David Blair was a pretty lucky man. He was supposed to take the spot of the second officer of the Titanic. He was pulled out at the last moment, which eventually saved his life. It was a great thing for him, but something clouded his joy. What if he was the only person who could have done something to save the ship and the passengers? 
Back in the day, ships didn't have smart advanced technology like they do today. They couldn't see a threat on the horizon. Binoculars were pretty helpful, but the crew members on the Titanic didn't have access to the room where they were kept. David Blair was the man responsible for the keys. He left the ship in a hurry and forgot to hand over the keys that were in his pocket. Maybe if the crew members had had access to the binoculars, they would have seen the iceberg on time and had enough time to change course. It's possible that the giant iceberg that sent the Titanic to the ocean bottom was made of snow that had fallen in southwest Greenland. Scientists even used a computer model to calculate the paths the iceberg took in any given year, taking into consideration ocean currents and weather readings for that year. It's possible that the iceberg was 1,700 feet long, with a weight of around 75 tons. By the time it collided with the Titanic, it had dwindled down to only 1.5 tons. Violet Constance Jessup was, as many called her, Miss Unsinkable. She was only 24 years old when she joined the Titanic crew as a stewardess. On the tragic night when the ship struck the iceberg, she was lying in bed. As soon as she heard that something was going on, she got dressed and quickly went to the deck. Violet helped passengers get into lifeboats. Four years later, she was on the Britannic, the Titanic's sister ship. Once again, the ship started sinking. Not only did the woman survive another accident, but she was also once again the one helping other people to escape the vessel before it disappeared below the surface. Meet Arthur John Priest. No, he isn't famous for being a painter or for discovering some long-lost treasure. He didn't invent some cool gadget or break any world records. No, Arthur John Priest is famous simply for being unsinkable. Proving one can be both lucky and unlucky at the same time, Priest was involved in and survived several mishaps at sea, including the fateful maiden voyage of the Titanic. Priest was not a rich man interested in sailing for pleasure. He was part of the working class, employed as a stoker or fireman, stuck for hours within the hot bowels of large steam-powered vessels. His job was dirty and difficult. He was responsible for keeping the furnaces lit, feeding them coal to ensure enough steam was produced for the engines to work. He had to be careful about not overheating the system or setting fire to the whole ship. The furnaces had to be carefully watched and constantly fed. He breathed it all in a while, working and fighting with the sweat and the dirt. He would often work shirtless because of the heat and was always covered in black coal dust. And when he finally had a break, his shared living quarters were nearby in the same part of the ship. He must have been good at his job, though, because he had no trouble finding work. But wherever he went, bad luck seemed to follow. The first incident was a mild one. As a young man, Priest worked on the RMS Asturias. The passenger liner first set sail in 1907, traveling between Southampton in the UK to Buenos Aires in Argentina. At some point during its maiden voyage, the ship suffered a small collision. The damage was bad enough that the ship returned for repairs. Thankfully, there were no reports of any serious injuries. Priest, unfazed, simply went to work on another ship. But his bad luck lingered on the Asturias. In 1914, the Asturias became a hospital ship, helping care for sick men and women around Europe while bringing them home to England. But in March 1917, at just around midnight, the ship was struck by a foreign object. Its hull was breached and the engine room flooded. The captain ordered everyone to abandon the ship, sending crew, patients, and health staff scrambling for the lifeboats. The vessel was still moving, powering through the water because the main controls, located within the flooded engine room, could not be turned off. The captain refused to leave the ship while people were still trying to escape. He was able to aim the Asturias towards Bolt Head, where it finally hit land and couldn't sink. The remaining lifeboats were lowered and the final survivors made it to safety. When they studied the damage on the ship later, the Asturias was declared a total write-off. It might be hard to pin this particular disaster on Priest. After all, he wasn't even on the ship at the time. But it seemed that many of the ships on which he served were destined for trouble. His bad luck followed him to his next job on the RMS Olympic, a massive ocean liner. The Olympic was big. In fact, it had been designed and built as part of the fleet that included the Titanic. 
But with size came sacrifice. The Olympic was great at moving in one direction, but very difficult to handle when it needed to turn. It was September 1911. The Olympic was trying to alter its course. The Hawk, a smaller ship sailing nearby, didn't give the larger vessel enough room to maneuver, and the two slammed into each other. Because the Hawk was engineered to deal with potential confrontations when out at sea, its reinforced bow tore through the Olympic. Two large gashes appeared on the ocean liner's side. The propeller shaft was badly twisted, and worse, the ship began to take on water. Somehow, the Olympic made it to shore without sinking, and nobody was seriously hurt. Priest had no idea that this was just a small taste of what his future held for him. He next found employment on a brand new ship, a better ship, an unsinkable marvel that was said to be the biggest vessel to have ever been built. Yes, he was going to work on the Titanic. And what a job. It took 29 boilers, requiring 850 tons of coal a day, to produce enough steam to power the Titanic. Priest was just one of 150 stokers toiling away in the ship's underbelly, keeping those fires burning day and night. He made around $30 a month. But on April 14, 1912, he would find himself flung from a world of extreme heat to one of blistering cold. At approximately 11.35 p.m., the crew spotted an iceberg. The Titanic tried to avoid it, but the alarm had been sounded too late. Five minutes later, the two collided. The iceberg tore through the hull, and the once watertight compartments inside were badly ruptured. As the cold Atlantic water flooded in, the ship began to sink. Distress signals were sent, but the closest ship, the Carpathia, was over three hours away. In the dark of night and stuck in the middle of nowhere, the crew and passengers panicked. Those who could scrambled for the lifeboats. Others jumped into the icy waters. In total, only 706 survived that terrible night. Priest, at the time of the collision, was down in the ship's lower quarters. He was on break, relaxing from a hard day of work. And as the ship went down, so did his chances of survival. He and his fellow workers were in the most dangerous position on the ship. They had to make their way through a maze of corridors and gangways, some of which were flooded in a mad dash to the deck. And then they faced the frigid water, jumping in and desperately swimming to safety. The ocean was so cold that Priest even suffered frostbite before finding his way onto a lifeboat. He was one of only 44 stokers to survive that night. After an experience like that, most of us would never set foot on a boat again. But Priest had to work. His next job also ended in disaster. He was offered employment on the HMS Alcantara. It went down in 1916, and Priest was again one of the few to make it to safety. He was badly wounded in the process. But he kept pressing his luck, and his next job as a stoker may have felt eerily familiar. He would be working on a ship built by the same people behind both the Olympic and the Titanic. And this ship, named the Britannic, was the biggest of the three. It was also believed to be a superior vessel, fitted with new safety features after the Titanic sank. For example, it had 48 open lifeboats, 46 of which were the largest ever used on a ship before. Two of these were even motorized and equipped with special communication devices. The good news? The Britannic survived its first trip without incident. It was already doing better than the Titanic ever did. However, on November 21st, 1916, the Britannic was shaken by a loud explosion while traveling through the key channel in the Aegean Sea. The hull was damaged, and some of the compartments began to fill with water. But, unlike the Titanic, the Britannic had been designed for just such an emergency. It had been fitted with five watertight bulkheads. Intact, these would help keep the ship safe and floating for a much longer period of time. But there was one issue. Portholes along the lower decks had foolishly been left open. As the ship tilted, the portholes let in water, which flooded the Britannic and hastened its descent into the sea. This effectively made those watertight bulkheads useless. The ship was going down fast, much faster, in fact, than the Titanic had sunk. 35 of the lifeboats were successfully launched, saving most on board. Of the 1,066 passengers and crew, 1,036 survived. Priest, his luck intact, was one of them. And yet, he still wasn't done with a life at sea. 
he accepted a position as a stoker on the Donegal. It was a smaller passenger ferry that had been converted for use as a hospital boat. In April 1917, it was struck by a foreign object while fleeing an unsafe situation. And though he suffered from a head injury, Priest was again one of the survivors. It took experiencing two collisions and four sinkings before Priest was finally ready to retire. In fact, he reportedly said he only gave it up because no one wanted to sail with him. Can you blame them? He would live out the rest of his life on dry land in Southampton, England, with his wife, Annie, and their three sons. But Arthur John Priest would always be remembered as the unsinkable stoker. <laughs>